Um, well, good evening to all of you. My name is Michael Holroyd, and I will be the moderator for the last portion of tonight's Candidates Forum, uh, and that is the mayoral section of this debate. Um, uh, I have one request. I, I did hear during the uh, councillor at large, I did hear a couple of cell phones. So please, could you put them on mute or turn them off? And those at the back, if you need to talk to the candidates that are leaving, if I could request that you go out there because sound does carry. Anyway, welcome. We have two candidates for mayor tonight, uh, Michael Bardsley and David Narkowitz. Uh, they will each uh, have one minute to present themselves to you, and at the close, two minutes each. Um, if you have a question, I will request that you come to this microphone, which I ask that you do not touch. State your name and your address. Uh, your question will be answered by both candidates and by previous agreement. The first question, uh, Michael will answer. He will have two minutes to answer it. And then David will have two minutes. And then Michael will have one minute to respond. Then the next question, David will start, have two minutes then Michael will have two minutes, and then David will have one minute to respond. So in a sense, uh, the person who asks, answers the question first will have one extra minute to like rebut anything the second candidate says, because the second candidate has, has the advantage of hearing what the first candidate has said. And this is what we've all agreed to. So uh, without further ado, would anyone like to come forward and ask oh, our no, candidates no, no. Your opening a question? Opening. I've made a mistake already. I do apologize. <laughs> The uh, moment has got to me. Um, Michael, you have one minute. I want to thank the uh, Ward 6 Association for uh, sponsoring tonight's forum. Two years ago, I stood before you, or perhaps I sat before you at this uh, candidate's forum and made clear my opposition for expanding the regional landfill over the Barnes Aquifer, and I strongly voiced my support for keeping open all four elementary schools. Time has proven these positions to be correct. I mention this because I feel like those two things reflect my leadership abilities, making important decisions by using critical thinking skills and not by political pressure, having the courage to stand up and do what is right and being motivated by a vision for a healthy, vibrant community. What more could you ask for than the next mayor in Northampton? Thank you. I want to begin by thanking my colleague, uh, Councillor Marianne LaBarge, the Ward 6 Neighborhood Association, and Water Not Waste for sponsoring tonight's debate. It's an honor to be a candidate for mayor and to be running for this important office. Northampton is an excellent place to live, to work, to learn, to run a business, and to raise a family. We have much to be proud of as a community, but we also face many challenges. I'm running for mayor because I want to keep Northampton strong and I want to make it better. I believe that my experience at the federal, state, and local level, combined with my record of community volunteerism and city council service, has uniquely prepared me to lead Northampton. I believe I am the candidate with the positive vision and the proven record of leadership and results who can move our great city forward. I look forward to this evening's conversation and the opportunity to share my views and my vision on the important issues facing our city. Thanks to everybody for coming out tonight and, and I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you both. Um, any questions? Would you like to come to the microphone, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes. I did see you first, and then you next. Okay. Yep. Peter Jones from Briarwood Drive. I'm going to introduce a subject which is uh, very near and dear to the hearts of everyone here, I think. Pizza and access. Mayor Higgins had a habit, a practice, of meeting with people at the senior center on the second 
Tuesday of every month and providing pizza and assorted non-alcoholic beverages. If elected, and I don't think you need two minutes to answer this, will you continue the practice? Uh, well, minus the pizza, I have already started the practice. I've been meeting down at the, the senior center um, uh, for four uh, different weeks now since September, and I have meetings scheduled for another three weeks down there um, every uh, Tuesday morning. I've been uh, actually, I've been serving tea and uh, cookies. Um, it's a, a 10 o'clock meeting. If it shifts, I thought it was a little early for pizza. Um, and I have been asked the questions down there. Yes, I will continue uh, to uh, meet down at the uh, uh, senior center, but I will meet in other places as well. I will go into the, uh, our public housing projects and have access um, uh, for those residents there so they can come and meet with uh, the mayor. And I will, um, and I've already have meetings scheduled in some of those places. Uh, the the heart to your, of your uh, question isn't pizza; it's access. And I am really committed to making uh, local government accessible and feeling that people um, are connected to local government, that their local leaders are listening to them. And that's a complaint that I hear a lot: that people feel like they haven't been heard and they're not involved. And whether it's the senior centers or people who are living in McDonald House or Savile House or even the uh, businesses downtown. And I've gone around to all the, uh, many of the businesses downtown. I have two days doing that. I probably have a, a few more hours to put in downtown as well as in Florence and listening to our uh, local uh, business owners and hearing what they, their concerns are. And they too feel like they haven't been listened to, they haven't been heard. So um, I, my, uh, um, a term as mayor will be all about access, increase access for citizens. So thank you for the question. Is that a yes? That's a yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, 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 Mr. Jones, not only will I come to pizza on the second Tuesday, I may even ride my bike down there, <laughs> okay? Uh, Okay, I, 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 I am definitely committed to, 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 to continuing that practice and I'm also committed to, uh, to, to being open and accessible to all citizens and to try to hold uh, uh, neighborhood meetings and forums all around the city. It's something I've been out uh, since, the, since announcing my candidacy. I've been out knocking on doors all over the city. I've knocked over well over a thousand doors. Uh, I've held uh, meetings in kitchens and living rooms all around the city. Uh, and I think it's important for a mayor to get out of City Hall and to be out in the city and to hear the ideas, the concerns. Uh, one of the things I talk about in, uh, in relation to the budget process is really wanting to get out before I craft that budget, before I put together my budget, to get out into the city and to hear the ideas that people have, what the values are, what the priorities are, so that the budget reflects those. Um, so I think it's a great question, and I think it's important for the mayor uh, to be out in the community, be accessible, and to hear uh, what the ideas and concerns that people have. Thank you, David. Any? Yes. The, um, to elaborate on the, uh, the issue of uh, access, um, I, I don't think anybody's going to say that they're against greater access. I mean, th those people are going to say that. Um, I think all the candidates for at large as well as for mayor will agree to that. But I think you have to look at the track record. And I have a track record of listening to and working with a very wide range of uh, folks with, who live within the city. And uh, sometimes I have been criticized by representing or working with people um, who have uh, different other political views or, or whatever. And I will listen and work with, uh, with anybody. I don't make judgment on people's, I don't label people. One of the questions last night was the whole thing about Hamp NoHo and which, which camp are you going to represent. I don't believe in labeling people. That's what prevents access. So I will work uh, with everybody. I will have an open door, and I will go out into the community and meet with people. Okay. Next question. 
Loretta Goodgen from Florence. Uh, my question is, please tell us an example of the most difficult issue or problem you have faced as a public servant and explain how you handled or resolved it. David? I think uh, last night we were, we were asked a question about the, the landfill process and I think uh, one of the more frustrating parts of that process for me was, uh, was trying to deal with the issue of being told we were supposed to be restrained in the process by the fact that, uh, that uh, we had to make this final decision when it got submitted to us by the Board of Public Works. It was frustrating. Uh, I had constituents contacting me, trying to engage in conversations about it, trying to figure out you know, where my, what my position on the matter was. Uh, we were told we weren't allowed to do that. We had to wait so that we wouldn't violate people's rights. We had to wait until that final uh, judgment, uh, until it was submitted to us. Um, so I think that was probably one of the more frustrating issues. And so the way I reacted to it was I tried to, f I tried to change the system. I tried to put forth legislation uh, in that process to try to see if we could reorient the process so that city councilors were more in a policy-making role, not in that zoning role that we had been boxed into. Uh, and, and I think we actually had a good conversation about it. It was late in the process, uh, but we hadn't, had that, we hadn't had that conversation prior to setting up the parameters for how we make that decision. So one of the things I learned about that, I mean, we, we moved on, the decisions were made, but I think one of the things I learned about that was I think it's important when you go into making a big decision like that or setting up a big decision-making process that you're really clear that the, the community understands and that the, the decision-making body understands you know, what that process is, what the decision points are, who, who has the authority, and who is best suited to make the certain decisions, and that policymakers, elected officials should be making policy decisions. Uh, zoning regulators, zoning officials should be making those kinds of decisions. So uh, that was probably one of the most difficult positions to be in uh, as an elected official, as somebody who is a representative, uh, to be told that you had to kind of uh, restrain yourself and not fully engage in the issue. Uh, so my solution was to try to change it, wasn't successful, uh, but it's, it was a learning experience and something I'll carry with me as we move forward into other big decisions. Uh, there, there's been several uh, difficult decisions, and certainly uh, the votes on uh, around the landfill um, is included. Uh, but for me, I, I would pick the uh, the vote on the educational overlay district for uh, Smith. Um, and part of the difficulty there again was a very poor process. Um, not all the information was presented um, to the council that they needed the vote on all at once. Um, the citizens were not involved in it. Um, we, I remember at a joint public hearing of the ordinance committee and the, um, the, the planning board, um, there was a contingent representing Smith, but the, uh, uh, the abutters had not been invited. And the rationale for not in, inviting the abutters is that the, the city's policy for inviting uh, in abutters or notifying them was for zoning changes, and this, an overlay district, wasn't a zoning change. And so because of that, I spoke up and I delayed the process. I said we needed to have another round of meetings. Uh, citizens became involved in it. And it got a little contentious because it felt like the uh, decisions had already uh, been made. And part of the difficulty to that, it was really a two-part decision. Um, in that the overlay district um, was what we were voting on, but was what was motivating or justifying that for in a lot of people's mind was this agreement that was reached in private by the mayor and by the president of Smith College. And we couldn't discuss a vote on that because that was a done deal, it was on the overlay district. And uh, almost everybody involved in that decision making knew that the overlay district wouldn't uh, succeed by it wouldn't be passed by itself there wasn't really the justification for that and at the council I um, realized that when I voted against it that it was not a politically expedient vote but it was a vote of conscience and that is the vote I took I, I, we've talked about this issue this education overlay district several times in, in the last debate in this debate it's come up it's been raised as an example I do think it's important to point out that, uh, that my opponent was the city council president 
uh, during this process that he points to as a, as a failed process. Uh, he was in a position of leadership, second in leadership in the city, um, and he had an opportunity, I believe, to shape that process. He had an opportunity to be in the mayor's office and say, there's not going to be any agreement signed without my assent as council president. That's been the role that I've played as city council president. Uh, I've been very forceful in making sure that the legislative branch is strongly represented. I've been very much in the mayor's office making sure that I am in control of the city council agenda, making sure that I am involved in big decisions and that the city council is not left out. So it's fine to talk about an issue that happened five or six years ago and complain about the process, but I think we also have to take responsibility for our role and our leadership in the process or lack of leadership. So I think that's an important distinction for people to keep in mind. My name is Barry Roth. I live here in Florence. Uh, my question goes to best practices, and it's somewhat akin to what you're just discussing. Um, I will say, preface this by saying that I am uh, very involved in the, uh, the issues, and I have had real life experience with just how the doors are closed within the city government. But in particular, I was aghast at a meeting in which Gene Tacey presented facts having to do with extra revenue tied to the uh, fire department. What was particularly astonishing to me, and this goes to how best practices will be handled in the future, was the fact that Gene Tacey pointed out that by contract, the city was obligated to provide $250,000 to the fire department, but that left roughly $250,000 that could be decided at a later time. And the city council, led by uh, David Narkowitz at the time voted to go ahead and not delay discussion on the matter. And what's more, the laws are designed, as I understand it, as best practices so that there's two votes, one, one in the finance committee, one that night in the city council, and then deliberately the law states that there should be a second vote that should be done then a cup at the next meeting of the city council so that people will have a chance to be heard. And my question is, how is it that you and the city council at that moment went ahead and insisted on having a double vote within night, and how does that, uh, how is that consistent with best practices that you plan on bringing, you both plan to bring to government? Thank you. Uh, Michael. He's pointing to you, but I think it's me. Is it? It's me. Uh, no, you went first last time. <laughs> so the next no, question, you go you next. You just said the thing. Yes, you, I just I, I'm <laughs> keeping a record here. Michael is first. No, he, okay. I know it's. We, well, we, I, we should keep to the order. I think you, okay, I, I think you went first, and then I did. We've, this is the third question. Okay. I got it. Okay, I'll, no, you I'll are follow first. your lead. Okay, I'll take your lead. The um, what happened at the uh, the, the city council uh, meeting re regarding that, and, um, and that was a, a recent um, uh, experience, is that there were there was a um, an order, financial order, put before the uh, the finance committee that was meeting that night within the city council. Um, oddly enough, it was support, was the sponsor of it said it was the uh, finance committee, and they hadn't even deliberated it yet. And they deliberated, they referred it out at the same meeting, and then the, uh, the city council took two votes on it the same night. And that is really a, a violation of the, the, the spirit of the process. It does not allow for uh, citizen involvement. It doesn't allow for city councilors to go out and get additional information. And it is an issue that had been brought up before. It wasn't that it was the first time this was People knew this was uh, coming down the, uh, the pike, so to speak. The whole question around that contract and some of the things in it had been raised. And they needed uh, time, if the council has had questions, in order for them to do their job as a representative, representative, uh, representative uh, elected leader, they needed the time in the process to do the, uh, to do the research to go back to their constituency. And um, I, I, it's really uh, an example of very uh, poor decision making and um, a lack of leadership. And I think that we need to be a lot clearer in what the decision making process is. 
there was a best practices committee that made 10 recommendations. And if you go through those recommendations, many of them have not been met. Um, and one of them was to uh, make clear the practices for making decisions for each of, uh, for the committee and for the cities. And that has not been done. So I, th I would definitely take steps immediately in that direction. So we, uh, we have a system where the uh, stipends for the firefighters are paid out sort of at the end of the year. So they work all year. Uh, they begin at the beginning of the fiscal year. They work all year. At the end of the fiscal year, the stipends are then calculated based on how many calls they make, uh, based on the ambulance runs. All that data is collected, and then an order comes forward to the city council, basically to pay them for the previous year's work. It always comes at this first meeting in July, and in fact, we, it's been traditional that there'd be a second reading because it's an agreed upon compensation, and so uh, that's why we've did, we waived rules and took two readings on it. And in fact, I looked back historically, because this has been a practice in 2004, and my esteemed opponent has voted on two readings on the same night on this very issue on at least once or two occasions. And if you go back and check the record, you'll see that, because it's been a long-standing practice. Uh, so in terms of saying that this was something that was different or out of the ordinary, at that, at that meeting, there was a discussion about should we, uh, should we go ahead and, and delay the vote or should we have a long discussion about what's uh, the, the compensation and should we try to recalculate it. I was very clear that it's perfectly appropriate to discuss compensation for employees, but that has to be done in the collective bargaining process. The, the vote we were taking was to essentially pay people for, for, for benefits that they had been contractually obligated, work they had already performed, and we were going back and, and, and paying for that services that they had done in the previous year. And again, look back at the record, you'll see that this has been a long-standing practice, uh, that this, the second reading has been taken. And we do that on occasion where we have systems like this where we have a deadline, where we have paychecks to issue, um, and the fact that it had been a long-standing practice. So that's the, that's the backstory on that particular issue. I did work on the Best Practices Committee. I was the co-sponsor of the resolution with my opponent. I co-wrote the recommendations. And as City Council President, I've been working very diligently to try to implement many of those recommendations. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the, the, uh, David's missing uh, the point. There were three votes. There weren't two votes that evening. There were three votes, and it's clued, uh, the Finance Committee. And the, uh, it was not a long-standing uh, tradition because it was only a, a relatively newly uh, negotiated contract, contract. And the key thing is here is that a counselor had a question and that question couldn't be answered and that was known ahead of time. And it is an issue not about the negotiations but about some uh, a principle uh, regarding one of those uh, um, aspects of that contract. And it merited a discussion by the Finance Committee of whether or not this is a policy that they approve. And it's the whole thing about having excess revenue that is distributed as sort of like a, um, a bonus compensation. And that isn't getting into the, uh, the contract. That is a concept that they could have discussed in the Finance Committee. And that was legitimate. Hi, my name is Megan Zinn, and I live on Cherry Street in Northampton. My question is, please describe the actions you took as city council president to ensure more transparency in city government. Um, as I started to allude to in my last uh, statement, um, when I became city council president, I took a number of steps to try to make sure that we opened up our process uh, the way the city council operates. One of the very first things I did is we had several new members of the council. I put together a workshop uh, both for councilors and for the public to understand how our city council rules function, what the parliamentary rules are. That was something that wasn't done for me when I was a new councilor, and, and we sort of had to learn as we went along. Uh, so I thought it was really important to do that to kind of clear the air. I also put together several workshops on our public comment process, because that had been one of the issues that came up in the best practices report. I also implemented new procedures for how we display our agenda on the screen behind us, and a new timing system that was more open, more equitable, so people could see how much time they had. 
probably one of the most important things I dealt with was the contentious issue of executive session minutes. This has become a sort of a political firestorm in a previous election, uh, and, and I took responsibility for that. I took leadership for that. It's not the mayor's job to take care of the executive session minutes. I took responsibility for that. I put in place a policy that the council president would review those executive session minutes quarterly and release them to the public so that the public could have full access to the deliberations that we had done in executive session. Since implementing this policy, I've probably released more executive sessions than any other uh, city council president before me. Uh, so that, those are a few examples of the ways that I've tried to implement transparency. In terms of the best practices report, um, we've also tried to make improvements to the city website. Uh, putting up more information about our open meeting law requirements. Meeting notices are now up there in a new <coughs> meeting calendar so people can see all the meetings that are going on in the city and have an agenda for them. We've also uh, done a lot of work to try to make the application process more accessible to people who want to apply to serve on committees. Uh, I actually created a search engine, which oddly enough our original website didn't have so that people can actually start to search for documents and find them. So I've done a lot of work on this issue of transparency. How do we open up the process for people so they can understand their government better? I think uh, one of the, uh, the best examples of my efforts around uh, transparency has been my chair of the Ordinance Committee, which I did for over 10 years. And in the Ordinance Committee, um, we took up a number of uh, um, uh, matters, and a lot of times with ordinance was coming through, it was the first time that people who were being affected by it or had a concern with it had the opportunity to come forward. And I always had a very open meeting. We allowed a wide variety of folks with concerns. We gave them ample time. If necessary, we carried it over to uh, another meeting. Um, there were several times where we sent it back to the sending parties to uh, deal with uh, some concerns. So the ordinance committee became the place where people really worked very hard on, on ordinances um, to make sure that they were well crafted and had a lot of input before they went back to the, the council. Um, I restructured um, the uh, city council rules. They were basically a, a sheet of rules that were uh, listed in order as, as they've been uh, passed over the years. It was very confusing to people. If you look at them right now, it's a very well-organized uh, booklet. I did that with the city uh, council clerk at the time. Um, I also was, took a lead in restructuring uh, the, the city council committees, so they were clear in their function and their meetings. And so people had input and they knew which city councils were, uh, committees were dealing with what issues and who were the, rep the representatives were. And it's a much uh, more well-functioning uh, committee structure. The committees are really sort of like the engines that do a lot of the work for the council. And it's, I think it is a lot clearer now to people um, how that work is getting accomplished. Yeah, I just want to add a couple of other items that, that I worked on as, as city council president, which was uh, to try to work more public forums into the process when we deal with big issues. So we had a couple of contentious issues that came up uh, during this last session. Uh, we had a resolution uh, that was brought forward by citizens that generated a lot of interest, and we thought it was best to move that into a public forum session so that people could have a more free-ranging discussion on the issue, give input to the council. And I think that's been a good model, and we've tried to do that in other cases uh, where we have big decisions like that, where kind of the strict formalities of our formal city council process really doesn't allow for the same level of discussion, the same level of input. So that's something that I've tried to do as well as city council president, to try to incorporate a little bit more of that into the process. Um, I think in terms of the rules, yes, there were changes made to the rules, uh, but there were still a lot of people who didn't understand them couldn't figure out how to use them. Uh, so one of the things I did was actually create charts to explain what each of those parliamentary rules were so that people could actually have a crib sheet so they could understand what motions applied to what, uh, what particular actions on the council floor. So there's always room for improvement in terms of our rulemaking and how people can understand how the process works.
My name is Andrea Egido. I live on Spring Street in Florence, and I am a teacher in this fine school that we're sitting in tonight. Um, over the past few years, our city has increased revenue by passing a Proposition 2.5 override and meals tax, has reduced health insurance costs by increasing employee co-pays and freezing teachers' wages, and the Northampton School employees gave back furlough days to help with the budget deficit. With that said, my question is twofold. With all of the revenue raising and cost cutting, why is it that our schools are still suffering from an extreme decrease in funding and cuts to programs? And, it, and my second question is, in addition to lobbying the state for funding, which we know will probably continue to decrease, we all know we have to go there first, how do you propose rectifying this dire situation locally to keep our schools as wonderful as they are and have been? Thank you. Um, well, as I think most people know, I've been a, a public school educator for uh, 33 years, and my passion is with the schools, and that's what get me involved in local government. Um, I also deeply respect the, uh, the, uh, the work of teachers, and I was um, saddened and shocked by the treatment of the teachers this past June and as also around the override. And I think we can disagree and we, um, we can have uh, financial problems, but it doesn't call for disrespecting teachers and uh, bullying the union. Um, so I would, that's one of the things that I would definitely uh, change and work with, because I know there's a, a morale problem with teachers and, and other public employees within the city. Um, it, the, uh, the funding issue is at the heart of the problem, and I think we need to look at ways to generate uh, more uh, revenues. And one of the ideas that I will, uh, as mayor, um, act as a leader on, on trying to implement, and it'll obviously be uh, voluntary, but is uh, trying to collect a, uh, a, a payment in lieu of taxes is what it's commonly referred to. But we have nonprofits who, uh, by state law, are exempt from paying taxes on property. Um, Mayor Menino in Boston has implemented a program um, where voluntarily, over uh, five years, he's hoping to get 25%. If uh, Northampton implemented a program that was uh, only 10% of the, the value of the property that is currently not being taxed, that would generate over a million dollars uh, to the city. And I realize it's voluntary, it's going to be controversial. Um, I'm used to dealing with controversy. I will step forward and lead that effort. Uh, I also am a very strong supporter of the schools. I have two kids that are in the public schools who've come up through the elementary system. They're now at JFK. I've been a volunteer in the schools as a parent. I've also been for about 12 years a member of the board of the Northampton Education Foundation and have helped to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for our schools. So I care deeply about them and I care deeply about the work that goes on in them. We've had incredible teachers. In terms of, uh, in terms of the funding, you're right. This community has really stepped up to the plate in terms of passing overrides. We've passed, uh, we've passed the um, meals tax. We've raised parking fees. We've done everything we can do at the local level. And we do have to lobby our state legislators to try to help us in terms of giving us more revenue, in terms of lobbying for a more progressive tax system, for example. We now have a flat tax that really doesn't give Massachusetts the revenue it needs. Um, that's a long-term project. That's a lobbying project that takes leadership, and I've been part of that. In terms of how we raise revenues at the local level, I think the pilot idea is an interesting one. I will point out that Mayor Menino's project is really aimed at properties over $15 million in value, um, which if you take a look at Northampton, you know, there's probably only a couple of nonprofits that would qualify under that metrics. I, and so that's, you know, it's a good idea. It's something to look at. But in terms of how are we going to generate revenue for the budget, I think one of the things we have to do is really, in our budgeting process, really dig down into the numbers and figure out, are there ways we can do things more efficiently? Are there cuts we can make? Are there ways we can consolidate services? Can we continue to regionalize services so that we can try to squeeze out some savings in the budget? I also think economic development is a really important piece of this because that's how we can grow that budget to be able to provide more revenue, and not revenue that's putting a burden on homeowners, but revenue that's on the commercial side. So I think we really have to be 
active and proactive in promoting an economic development strategy. I was the economic development director for Congressman John Olver, so this is something I have a little bit of experience with and something that I really want to put in place a plan for how we go about uh, enacting measures that will grow our local economy, create jobs, and also give us the additional revenue that we need so we can continue uh, to fund our schools and provide the resources that we need to have a quality education for our kids. Uh, and I agree that economic development is a, uh, a key part of that. And in case we're not asked that question, I'm, I'm going to talk about some economic development ideas that I have uh, mentioned. I think we do need to do a lot more to support our local businesses. Um, they do not feel supported by the city at all. I've heard that firsthand. Um, I think we can do a lot to um, promote hiring local. Um, there's a lot of businesses in the city that go out, bring the jobs outside of the uh, the, the city, I think, a way of keeping dollars here. Um, we can do a lot more to recruit um, green businesses. I think it's a very uh, uh, good fit for our community. And I think we need to do a lot more in exploring, uh, exploring co-ops and work our own businesses. There's a lot of resources at the university, at GCC. We have not tapped into those at all. In short, our economic development uh, policy has really not been focused in that direction. And if David had some talents in there, they haven't been, uh, they haven't shown up in terms of working to bring in those jobs so far. I think, yeah, you're next. And you're next, okay. No, didn't you have, no, didn't you have your hand up? Yeah. No, well actually the woman behind I said was next. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I said you were after. So I don't have any notes, so I'm not that prepared. But I can tell you, I'm, so I'm, my name is Lisa, and I'm a resident uh, on Golden Drive in Florence, and I have a solo law practice in downtown Northampton, the Carriage House. I'm only here in Northampton maybe about three years. So what I've learned from colleagues and friends when I ask about the difference between you two, I get the history, where you've each been, I get what you've done in the past. But I don't know the differences between the two of you now in the future. When I look at the newspaper yesterday and they talked about the debate at Northampton High School, the same thing happened. It was, well, so how do they differentiate from one another? What I'd like to know is if either one of you was elected, how would you be different than what the other opponent would have done? I just need to know how you differ from each other, not in the past, but in the future. Thank you. Good question. David, your thoughts. Well, I think uh, the things that I've been talking about in this campaign, I've tried to run a very positive campaign, talking about myself, my attributes, the things that I bring to the table. So when I get this question, the things that I point to are, first of all, putting forth a really positive vision for the city. Uh, we have a great city. Uh, yes, we have challenges. Yes, we have problems that need to be fixed. But I start from the place that we have a great city, and I want to lead it forward into the future. So uh, I think putting out very specific ideas, putting out very specific proposals, getting out and around the city and talking to people, and, and really putting forth a vision for where I want to take this city. But in terms of, I think another important piece of that is, what's your leadership record? What is the stuff you've done as a leader to actually show that you can take a vision, you can take something like traffic safety, trying to make neighborhoods safer, or you can take something like energy efficiency, or you can take open government, you can take issues and actually lead on them, bring people in, collaborate with people, uh, talk to the people that have served on committees with me, talk to the people in neighborhoods where I've worked with them on solving problems, talk to those people and you'll understand the difference in terms of what I bring to the job, the leadership that I'll bring to the job, having a positive vision but also having the skills, the experience, the ability to bring people and build consensus to actually put that vision into practice. I think that's the distinction that I talk about when I'm out walking around the city. And again, look at our records, but also talk to the people that we've worked with, look at the things that we've accomplished, look at the programs that we put forward, and I think that's the truest measure of who is the best person to lead this city into the next decade and who can provide the leadership to face the challenges that we're gonna have to face. My vision in, um, is focused on the quality of life for working middle class families in this community. And increasingly, it be, has become difficult for working middle class families, and I include in that new families who would like to move here and retired folks, 
to live in this uh, community. And a lot of them are feel marginalized and left out of what's going on in this community. And that has been um, something that I have said and sometimes I feel like the, the lone voice in speaking up for some of those residents who have felt uh, excluded. And I have represented those and listened to them and worked with them and they have uh, uh, expressed their frustrations as not being uh, listened to. So that is, in terms of the future and moving forward, I am looking at this to being home for a wide range of people um, earning different levels of income. Uh, I have also a track record of dealing with problems. And if um, speaking the truth and identifying a problem is being negative, then that's, that's, that's a sad statement. Uh, to me, it is a, a positive um, attribute when you're willing to deal with a problem. And there have been problems here that have, um, have been evident in the city, and I have not been afraid to step forward and, and deal with the problems. Whether it's been expanding the landfill over the aquifer, building a uh, hotel downtown that was inappropriate, the Smith Overlay District, all of those that I was a person on the council who stepped up and said, wait a minute, there's a problem here. And in some cases, I was the only one. Um, there is, uh, David made a uh, comment earlier about my leadership around the Overlay District, and that kind of reflects a problem that he has, because he hasn't been around a lot to know some of the things that happened. And in fact, I did have private meetings with the mayor, and in fact, I did have private meetings with the planning department, and the answer was no, we're not flexible. So that's what David doesn't know, because he wasn't in the room, and he never asked me if I had had those meetings. David. Yeah, I mean, again, we've just ticked off three problem areas, the landfill expansion, the, the hotel, the overlay. Again, these were all issues that happened when my, colleague, when my opponent was the city council president. And part of being a leader, part of uh, being able to solve problems is not just to talk about them, not to talk about them after they've occurred, not to, not to wait till the 11th hour, but to actually be engaged in leadership and trying to address them before they arise. Trying to be proactive in your leadership and, and taking the responsibilities that you have to lead uh, seriously and working hard to try to avoid those problems. So again, it's okay to talk about these issues. The key is not just talking about problems and identifying problems, but who can solve problems? Who can bring people together? Who can, who, who can look at the facts? Who can gather the data? And who can come up with creative and innovative solutions to solving problems? Again, look at my record. Look at the things, look at the tough problems that I've tackled and how I've come up with solutions in a consensus building process to do that. First the gentleman with the beard, then I think it was, no, the woman with the glasses after him, okay? <laughs> Thanks very much. My name is John Sinton and I live in Florence. And have I got a deal for you? <laughs> I've got this idea for a hotel at the Roundhouse. And I'd like to know exactly the process that you're going to make me go through and who you're going to talk to and who are the people I'm going to have to talk to in order to develop this area. What's the process? Thank you. John, your, uh, your question really hits the heart at the, uh, the, the problem with the city right now. M many of our decisions are not um, uh, made on the basis of their merits. Many of them have m other factors coming uh, into play. Uh, for example, on the, uh, the whole thing with the, yes, uh, the overlay district, when I was bringing out concerns uh, at the city council meeting, one of my colleagues made the comment that the more we discussed it, the more confused she was, and she wanted to just vote on it and get it over with. That's on record, you can watch, watch that. And she is not a uh, person who lacks intelligence, it just shows that the process around decision making is backwards. I taught decision making in high school. You start off with getting all the ideas possible. 
So if you come to me with one specific idea, what I would say to you, John, first of all, we have to open up the process to a wide range of ideas. And then we have to do a, a, uh, a community dialogue to get the assessment of what the community response is. And we have to also look at the, uh, the reality around costs and the, how they relate, how your project and other proposals relate to that part of the city and it is in keeping with the historic character of that part of the city. So there's a number of considerations that I think we need to do in moving forward and looking at that. And then when we decide, we get an idea of what we're looking for, we have to write a, a RFP that reflects those uh, uh, qualities, those concerns that we have uh, in the RFP. And the RFP that was written last time was a blank slate because we were going after the biggest bang for the buck. And uh, that, isn't, that isn't what you should do. And you should write an RFP that reflects what you want for that uh, project. So the process is going to be a little bit longer than you think, John, but it will end up in a better result. Uh, when I think about this, this project and the, and the chance to do it over again, the, the, I have this vision in my head, sort of metaphorically, of putting a big sign there on that property that says, ideas wanted. You know, we want to get ideas from not just citizens, not just from residents. We want to get ideas from developers, from creative developers who may have ideas about how we should develop a piece of property like that. Historic development people, uh, people who may have ideas about uh, creative uses to combine, you know, parking structures or, or uh, incorporating green space, all those kinds of ideas. And doing that process before we develop an RFP, before we actually decide what is it that we're going to do? We have so many great professionals in this community, planning professionals. We've, we've used charrettes uh, to, to go ahead and bring in the community, bring in the public, and try to come up with some of the ideas, some of the goals that we want to reach, and then we go ahead and put together an RFP. So that's sort of a vision that I have. And I, ha I, I hate to keep going back to this, but this idea of the hotel process and the fact that it was a blank check or it was a blank, an RFP that was sort of open-ended, the city council had control of that parcel of land. The city council had full control, could have spelled out all the parameters of the process, uh, and, and the city council, led by my opponent as city council president, essentially gave that right away uh, to the mayor, gave it away, and said, you do it what you want. So I think that was a lost opportunity where the council could have stepped in and could have put in some of these processes that we're talking about, could have put in um, some, some, some come back to us when you have some more ideas developed, and then we'll move down the road. So I think there has to be oversight of the process, working with the city council and the mayor to make sure that that public process that I've tried to describe is, is set up well, is monitored well, there's good feedback on it, and then we're able to actually make a good decision. Well, David, here's another fact that you obviously don't know, is that we, the, the Finance Committee had a very um, detailed discussion with the mayor, and we put out a number of very specific ideas that we wanted to be reflected in the RFP, and she was charged with doing that in conjunction with the Finance Committee. And when it came out of the Finance Committee, that did not reflect anything that was around in the discussion of the, uh, uh, with the uh, fi when it came from the um, Economic Development Committee. It didn't come with any of the ideas that had been discussed. One of the ideas was doing a, uh, turning that into a, an art park. And we wanted a hotel in there or other building that would work cooperatively with the Academy of Music there was an idea of eventually moving the Center for the Arts um, at that time, uh, looking for a new headquarters in the basement of the, um, uh, the, the Memorial Hall. And that would have been like a little enclave downtown for the arts. And that was totally ignored in the RFP. Good evening. Well, I think it's great that we have two really qualified candidates for mayor. So my name is Hope, Hope McCary. I live on Acrebrook Drive in Florence. I'm new. My question has to do with technology. I'm not sure if you're aware, and I was shocked and surprised to learn that um, 
the employees of the city of Northampton uh, watched their IT training on VHS videotape. Yeah. And um, some of the offices are entirely paper-based. And as the CEO of a, of a vibrant city, how would you look at technology as a tool to find efficiencies in the way the city is run and to reach out to constituents and um, build transparency? I, get, I often get criticized for being too much of sort of a techie wonk when it comes to city government, but it really is, I think it's the future. Uh, you know, I was part of the, the process working actually very closely with the city clerk when we switched to the e-code system. And I worked with her to go through many of those ordinances to, cle to clean them up and put them onto an online code system. that Now you don't have to buy this big fat book anymore. You can actually look online. People can look at our city rules and regulations. I've tried to push for these kinds of innovations in city government. Uh, I've tried to, to look at how can we use technology, uh, whether it's through some of the new applications that are available for people on their phones. Uh, many communities now are using smartphone apps to be able to call in potholes, to be able to call in other city services. Uh, I think those are things we should look at. Uh, and, I, and I agree with you completely in terms of our city's technology infrastructure. It needs a major overhaul. And one of the things I've called for uh, in my platform is putting together a technology review committee, a citizen review committee, because we have so many people like, like yourself, I've, I've lost you now, but who have expertise in this area who could help advise the city on what are the ways we can do, uh, what are the things that we can put in place to really upgrade ourselves in that capacity. Um, definitely agree about the, the, uh, the paper. We, we use far too much paper. I really want to push for, for example, an online procurement system. Uh, we have procurement. I've, as acting mayor, I sit all day and sign these contracts, five and six different copies of them. And I think to myself, how much of this paper could be done electronically? Not only good for the environment, but saving money and probably being a lot more efficient of someone having to carry this stuff all around to different offices. Um, I know in the schools they're trying to work a lot around technology. Our Smith Vocational and Agricultural School has been trying to really upgrade its, its curriculum in terms of technology. Uh, we put in a solar voltaic, a photovoltaic array recently that the city received as part of our Green Communities Grant and we're actually now teaching students how to work with this technology. So I think that's the wave of the future and it's really our best opportunity for trying to save money and do city services more efficiently. And I'm committed to that and I have a record of doing that. The, uh, I was unaware of the, the example you use, you use. That's the first time I heard that, but I'm not surprised because I have heard of, of, of similar things. It's, it's, there's a history in the city where we're um, changing around technology or trying to bring in technology and a lot of times it seems to be uh, complicate things more than help make things easier. Um, a recent example was the very expensive phone system that we uh, brought in after a great deal of discussion. And the advice we, were, we had to get, adopt that phone, si uh, phone system was from a uh, consultant we had hired, which um, you have to go with the advice you're getting from the con consultant because there was no other uh, ex expertise that we were getting to say, wait a minute, it could be done differently. And there were concerns raised but we didn't have enough to, uh, to go on. So I think having a citizens committee out there so we can tap into some of the talented, talent out there, the knowledge out there is what is needed to help balance things out. Um, we need, uh, and to, to stay on the point of your uh, question, we need it to increase the efficiency and therefore to cut down on some of the costs because I think right now we are perhaps wasting some dollars. So in terms of the training, the research, I think we need to start with having the expertise from the community look at what the problems are, help us define some of the problems, and then make some of those rec recommendations. And we really need to have a systematic plan to move forward with, with the technology. I, I appreciate the endorsement of my idea for a technology review committee made up of citizens. That's great. Um, I also think this has an application to economic development because I think one of the things that uh, one of the things that we can do is is our permitting system. We can st we, and we're trying to do that now. 
Right now, it can be very cumbersome for people to come in who want to do something with their home, they want to do something with their business, they have to fill out all kinds of paperwork. We're trying to put that online so that people have a streamlined way of filling out those applications and having them go to all the different agencies, all the different approving boards that need them. That's a way that we're not only making our system more efficient, but I think we also make the city more accessible and, and more streamlined for businesses, and it makes us more business friendly in that regard because I know the system right now is very, has been very complicated. What board do I have to go to? What, what, what approvals do I need? We can use technology to streamline that and also make the work of those city approving authorities much easier in terms of getting the information, having it in electronic form that people can have access to in the city. Um, so I think there's not only efficiencies that can be made, I think it can also make our city uh, more, more business friendly in that regard as well. Um, and I also think the schools are a place that we really need to upgrade technology. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we, it's, a, it's, it's really the wave of the future, and I think there's a lot of opportunities. I know we're moving to things like smart boards, and, and, uh, and we're trying to teach kids on computers, but I do see that when I'm in my kids' classrooms, you know, they have some pretty outdated equipment. And I think that, that's, if we're going to equip our kids with the tools that they need to, 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 to work in this new century, we have to be able to give them the technology as well. So I think that has to be a commitment. <coughs> You're next. No, after, after her, and then you're after him, okay? Three. Hi, guys. I'm Kathy McNally from Gleason Road. And my question is, even with all the listening that needs to be done and all the information that you're talking about gathering, sometimes you have to disappoint people. And I know from, in both of your careers, you've probably had to do that as, as elected officials. Can you talk about when that's happened and how you've handled disappointing constituents? Thanks. Well, I, I think there's probably uh, several handfuls of discontented constituents in the room tonight. I, I think I've had a, a history of uh, doing that. Um, you can't please everybody. I, I, that's your point, and at some point you have to make a decision. Um, I, in terms of having a process, a decision-making process, as I said earlier, you need a wide open process that includes people in the, in the beginning. You get the ideas, you give everybody an opportunity, all the facts are on the table, you, as other uh, ideas are raised and more information is needed to bring it in. That's the best that you can do, and then you have to make a decision at the end based on your assessment of what is good for the city, uh, based on your resources, based on the information you have. may not be right, but you have to do the best that you can. What ha happens where you get more discontented people and more anger is when a decision is already made, and then you move it forward, and then you give people the opportunity for input at the very end. And in fact, that is usually the model used around here. And to um, respond to uh, some of the allegations from, from David is that a lot of times the information that you need is not given to you up front. And then a lot of times the, in, uh, the input from citizens isn't done in a timely manner. So for example, around the overlay district, the information and feedback I was getting from citizens didn't happen until the very, very end of the proce process. And that really changed the dy dynamic. And it was complicated by the fact that the uh, rep elected uh, representative from that ward um, recused himself because of a conflict. And you had unrepresented citizens there. And I stepped forward. I, was, I went out in the community. I worked with them. I listened to them. I represented them. And that happened uh, at the end of the process because they hadn't been given an opportunity. And that's what changed it. Thank you. Uh, I too have experienced, uh, you know, when you first get elected, everybody loves you, and then the minute you start making decisions, that's when, the, that's when you know, people start to, you know, you, you have those natural disagreements. It's part of the process. It's part of being a leader. I think, uh, I think the way that I've tried to deal with it is, you know, making sure that, first of all, that you have a really good decision-making process, making sure that you've done your own research. Uh, I just heard someone say that, you know, no one gave me the information. I've never waited for anyone to give me the information. I've always gone out and sought it. I've researched it. I've tried to find the information. I've done my own independent research. Uh, and I think that's really important as a representative. And then I think you have to be able to articulate for people what your decision's based on. 
And I think uh, anyone who's watched me on the council, I've always been very clear. I've always explained the background of how I've come to my decisions. I've always tried to uh, balance out the various competing interests on a decision. And then I've made the decision. And I think uh, the response that I've gotten from my constituents when I've done that has been positive. Because even though you know, they, they don't, may not agree with the final outcome, they've respected the fact that I was willing to, you know, to, 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 to explain to them how that decision was formed, why I thought it was in the best interest of all the people that I represented, and I think that's the way you have to do it. Um, and certainly when you're mayor, uh, you know, you're making a lot of decisions every day. As I can tell you from the last three weeks uh, in, the, in the job I'm holding right now, the decisions come at you from all different angles, uh, and you have to be able to, you know, assess the information and make decisions and not be afraid to make decisions. And I think that's an important part of being a mayor. Um, so that's the way I guess I would explain it uh, in terms of how my process would work. The, um, I think it's the responsibility of the mayor on big decisions to provide the information. I don't think it's the responsibility of the, uh, the councilors to go out there and each of them find and do the research on their own. So at mayor, I will put out the information on each of the decisions in the beginning of the process. And that is something that hasn't happened, and I will, uh, I will uh, rectify that. Um, they are, I don't know if I'm running out of time on this one, but I think that is one of the, one of the, the big problems. So that is what I, what I would do, and I have done that um, in, in the past. The, it, then it's easy to say about going out and getting information, but it's, it's very hard to do that when you're a counselor, and especially when you're a counselor who is working. Most of our counselors, many of our counselors have jobs uh, when I was a counselor, I was working uh, over 40 hours a week in the public schools. And, you know, David had the luxury of not working for a long period of time, and he had that ec extra time. Not all the counselors can afford to do that. Thank you. So it's your turn. Okay, so it's your turn. Hey. My name is Pesha Black. I live on Northern Ave. Um, and I wanted both of you to talk about your plans and also your track record of making Northampton a safe place for our immigrant communities and a welcoming place. I didn't hear the. Sorry. I didn't hear the whole question. I, um, I wanted you to talk about your plans and track record of making Northampton a safe and welcoming place for our immigrant communities. Uh, immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. Immigrant communities? Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a great question, and, and it's something I think Northampton has had a, a real commitment to uh, to being a welcoming place to all people, and certainly immigrants is a, is, a, is is part of that. A couple of things we've done recently. Um, I was really happy recently to to be a co-sponsor and bring forward a resolution to the city council, uh, really s uh, making a strong expression that we are a welcoming place to immigrants in terms of. Uh, resisting a program, a federal program called the Secure Communities Program, uh, which is a sort of a federal program designed to try to uh, ostensibly to identify folks who are dangerous offenders, but what had been happening was really in, in going after immigrants, um, making them afraid to contact law enforcement, making them afraid to work with the police, and I was really proud that not only did the City Council adopt that resolution that I brought forward, but adopted it unanimously. Um, so that was one thing. The other thing I think we've tried to do is really provide services to people. We have um, the Center for New Americans, which is a great uh, nonprofit in our community. We actually just worked with them to, 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 to move them into a great new location at the James House, which is a new adult learning center. Uh, that this, and I'll uh, give credit to Mayor Higgins. That was a project that she brought forward where we tried to put in uh, services, one-stop services for um, adult education and literacy and community colleges, but also the Center for New Americans is there, which is, a, which is a, an organization that helps new immigrants incorporate themselves into the community. Um, so those are a couple of things that I've worked on in terms of my commitment to that issue. I also think we have to do outreach to our immigrant uh, communities. I was really proud. Um, we just had a hearing on the King Street uh, zoning. Um, uh, process and one of the things that uh, that uh, folks talked about was um, the fact that had we done enough outreach um, to people, particularly to, to perhaps non-English speakers who may not have understood uh, the process and and maybe needed some some bilingual support. So a couple of uh, one of my council colleagues, Maureen Carney, uh, set up a meeting 
um, uh, with uh, uh, Families with Power, which is, a, which is in the Hampshire Heights uh, neighborhood, to try to sit down with them and to try to get a dialogue and try to get some information out to them about the King Street Project and what the implications were for their community and, 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 the, and, and how those zoning measures might impact them. So I think those are a few examples recently of the work we've done to try to reach out to those communities. And I think it's really important that we do that. You know, I'm the grandson of immigrants, and uh, you know, we're a nation of immigrants. And I think we have to be a welcoming and respectful place. Uh, David started off with a statement of saying uh, Northampton has a history of being a welcoming place for all people. And I think that's really kind of glossing it over, because in fact, that is not the truth. If you look back, there has been uh, several incidents in our history where I don't think we're proud of the way we have treated Irish immigrants and the way we have treated uh, uh, gays and lesbians. That has done through a lot of hard work, and it's hard work of people um, speaking up, uh, kind of resisting the po those in power, uh, demanding changes, and if you look at my track record, I have a, uh, a long history of being on the front lines of human and civil rights. I was involved in the early uh, pride marches. Um, there's a picture of me going around uh, that uh, earlier of uh, me as a peacekeeper at the pride marches when we had very angry uh, demonstrators uh, shouting at the, the marches. And I, was, I had also been on the planning committees and, I, and been a speaker. I have brought young people into it. At my, when in the high school, I founded the Gay Straight Alliance. So I have really been on the front lines on uh, rights for all people. Um, I was the founder of the Human Rights Commission in Northampton. I was also the uh, counselor that sponsored the resolution that was uh, con criticizing concern with the uh, implications of the uh, Patriot Act. And when the uh, resolution came before uh, the council recently that, uh, that David just referred to, all the speakers, several of the speakers, referred to things that had been done in the past around human and civil rights, including the Human Rights Commission and the uh, Patriot Act resolution. And I took the lead on those. So I will, um, I vow to represent um, all people and to work with each of those uh, uh, constituencies of those groups. I've done a lot of outreach to our Casa Latina uh, recently, and, and so I'll end there, my time is up. I, I don't really have a rebuttal, just, uh, just uh, I think this is a, a great area of agreement and I have great respect for your long record of uh, civil rights work in the community. Question, uh, gentleman in the white shirt. My name is Fred Fierce. I live on Park Street in Florence. And first of all, I just want to say we're thank you both for coming here. We have some great candidates, and one of you is going to lose, and don't hold it against us, whoever that is. Um, and we've been talking about a lot of the big issues in town, and I had it my own personal experience once on a much smaller level, and I just wanted to get your reaction as to how you'd handle it. I have a learning disabled member of my family who had a summer job at the DPW, and the next year was applying again, and um, he went over and filled out the form at HR, and he would, went back to see his buddies at DPW, and they kept saying, we haven't seen the application. We would like to hire, but the application didn't come. And he went back and forth several times over several days and then came to see me and said he was very ups upset and couldn't figure out what had happened. So I thought, OK, I'll go check out. And I went over to the DPW and said, did you get the application? And they said, no. And then I went over to HR and I said, did you get the application? And they said, <coughs> yes. And we sent it to the DPW. So then I went back to the DPW and I asked the head of the DPW, could he check and see if it's there? And I was told no, uh, it didn't come. So then I went over to the HR department and I asked the head of the HR department, could you check and see what happened? Um, well, actually, I, I had asked a clerk first. And then I asked to speak to the head of the HR department and she was incredibly hostile and upset with me for interfering with the process. And I said, I'm not trying to ask anybody to be hired. I'm just trying to find out what happened to this application. 
And so then I called the mayor, whom I think has done overall an excellent job. We all have issues that we have with everybody. And as you said, we will with you as soon as you make a decision the wrong way. But I called the mayor to say, I just wanted to say that I was offended at the, the way this department head had reacted to me with such anger and hostility for interfering with the process. And um, the mayor was very defensive and aggressive at me uh, and said, well, you know, I, and, and, and really just completely defended her department head. Um, and as it turned out, one of the people at the DPW went over and they found that the clerk that had taken the application had left it under her somewhere at, at HR. But I know you have to balance um, how you deal with all the employees you have and all the big issues that you have, but you're also going to run into situations in which an individual person has a grievance with the way that person is handled by some department within the bureaucracy, whether it's a school or a police or the fire department or whatever. How, how would you as the mayor balance that kind of a situation? Um, earlier, I referred to my uh, uh, role as chair of the ordinance committee, and we handled a lot, we, a lot of complaints from, from citizens who were either uh, damage caused by potholes or falling trees, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I have um, uh, listened to a wide range of frustrated citizens. Um, in some cases, it was clear cut that it was very unfortunate, but it didn't fall within the parameters of our authority and what we had to. In some cases, it was, uh, there would seem like there was missing information, so we would go and ask for it and, and continue the decision. And in some cases, we came with information that said, listen, the city could have done better. Um, I am always trying to improve that process. The, uh, that the lost application, um, uh, is something that happens a lot, and there, there's a miscommunication somewhere al along the lines. Um, we need to do a, a better job of tracking, tracking things and keeping track of uh, who has it, where it is. Um, also, there's really no excuse, and I don't want to weigh in in this particular instance, but there's really no excuse for uh, uh, someone running into a hostile attitude, and that is, um, uh, People should be able to disagree or bring a complaint without getting that type of uh, response. And all too often in the past, that's what has happened. So if you disagreed and then and it happened, uh, you mentioned that it was with the mayor. And in the past, if you disagreed on an issue and it started with me and Council Mary Ann Labarge was in the room and we were complaining about the dump, you get a very, you got a very angry response and a very kind of a bullying, humiliating response. And if you haven't experienced it, then that, you don't know about it. But if you have, you know what it's like. And I would never do that to a citizen. Absolutely never. I would treat every individual with this respect. And I think that's what's been lacking in the past. Well, I, I, um, it's maybe a little late at this point, but I want to apologize on behalf of the city that you had to go through that process. Great city, and thank uh, you, but thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think, though, uh, I, and just a little bit of my background, I, when I was, I was in the Air Force, my training was actually in personnel, human resources, and one of my first uh, duty assignments out of, uh, out of basic training was as a customer service rep. Uh, at, a, at an Air Force base, and, uh, and so got a real firsthand feel for people coming in upset about their orders weren't correct, or they didn't get a promotion, or they didn't get the pay uh, that they needed, or they weren't able to find their housing assignment. So I gained a real appreciation for the importance of uh, customer service and really dealing with people in a respectful way and helping them uh, deal with the problem. And at the end of the day, whether it's the mayor or whether it's the, you know, the, the least paid employee of the city, we're, we're employees of, of the taxpayers. We work for the taxpayers, and our job is to try to provide the services you need. Now, of course, we also have to, you know, those, those employees deserve respect, and, we, and, and you know, citizens have to treat them with respect and mutual respect. But I think if there's an issue like that, it should be dealt with uh, respectfully. And certainly as mayor, if an issue like that came to my attention, I would try to deal with it, resolve it, find out what happened, find out why it didn't happen uh, the way it was supposed to happen, and get you an answer as well as an apology if you were not treated correctly. I think uh, this story also illustrates the need, as I pointed out in an earlier question, why an electronic 
application system would be so much more effective uh, in terms of filling out an online application, not having to worry about paper shuffling all around uh, the city. Uh, and I think we are moving towards that sort of a system. So I think an, a, an example where sometimes technology can avoid that kind of a bureaucratic sort of mess that occurs when you've got all that paper flying around. I don't know if it would have helped in your specific situation, but I think we have to, A, really have a focus on customer service. Uh, again, we, you know, we're working for the taxpayers. We're trying to deliver the services that you need. There has to be a mutual respect, of course, um, but at the same time, we also have to do that in a cost-effective way, and I think technology is one of the ways we can do it. Thank you. Um, I was, a, as you know, a guidance counselor in, in a high school um, and held other roles for uh, over 30, uh, 33 years. And I worked with a lot of students and families who felt, felt like they weren't being well served. And I worked with a lot of uh, students who other folks didn't want to work with. And um, I can't say that I solved every problem, but every student I think that I worked with um, felt like they were heard and that I gave my best effort to make sure that their needs were addressed as best they could within the resources that we have. And that's a pledge that I make uh, to the uh, voters of this city. And I have a track record on that. You people can talk to uh, former students of mine. There's a couple in the room. And they, I am a, the person who advocates for those who need advocacy. And I will ensure you that this will be a very responsive government and that uh, there's no excuse for something like that. And the, it is, um, that type of response is set from the top. And I will set that role. Um, I think you went, yes. Uh, then you're next, OK? And then you're off. Okay. I'm John Liebman from Sumner Avenue in Florence. Um, I'd like to ask a question about your budget priorities. We would like to believe that the city economy will grow. Um, our experience in the past several years is we've had very tight city budgets and we've squeezed those budgets a lot. So I'd like to ask two specific questions. Um, what's your lowest priority in the budget? If push comes to shove, what would, you, what would you hammer? Would it be municipal labor unions? Would you close a fire station, a school? What would it be? And the second question, part of that is, what would trigger you to push for a property tax override? David. Okay. Uh, certainly setting priorities is the most important job of the mayor in terms of the budget making process. And as I talked about in an earlier answer, one of the ways I want to do that is uh, not so much a top-down approach, but I want to get out into the community and hear from citizens like you about what are the priorities that you see in the budget and try to get feedback and try to get ideas from citizens on the budget. Um, in terms of, you know, what I think is the, I mean, all that, we, right now, you know, we provide a lot of critical city services and we, and after years and years of budget cuts, uh, our budgets have dwindled. It's been a struggle to provide them. The police, the fire, uh, you know, the plowing, the, 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 um, the, the water, the clean water that comes out of our faucets, and obviously the, the, the education that we provide to our students. So I think you have to look at all of those issues together. I don't think you can prioritize one over the other. But I do think when it comes to, to funding decisions, you know, you, there are areas where we think, th there may be areas where you can say, okay, this is an, a duplication of efforts, or this is an area where, I'll give you a classic example. You know, we had for years, um, our school department and our city had separate HR departments that were doing hiring, basically doing the same functions. And we decided, you know what, let's combine those. I think that's an example of, you know, an, another great example is where we had um, individual city departments all buying their own supplies separately. We consolidated that into one department to do that buying. So I think one of the things about opening up the budget to people and to give them, you know, there's a lot of great expertise and ideas. I think one of the things you can find is there are ways that you can find efficiencies in the budget and different ways of doing things. I think one of the things uh, that, that about me is I, I've never been somebody who is content to do things the way they've been done just because that's the way they've been done. Um, I'm a guy that thinks outside the box. Uh, you know, I'm the guy who supported the roundabout. You can't get much more out of the box than that. Uh, so in terms of, uh, in, I think you have to be innovative. And I think the other thing that we can look at, and I've talked about this as well, is, is there a way we can try to collect data more data on how we provide services and use that to make smart decisions about how we're going to allocate our resources. 
In terms of uh, lowest priorities, uh, my lowest priorities would be bucket load is uh, a new car for the uh, fire chief, a new floor for the fire station. Um, I use those as examples because right now we don't have a priority system. And I would, uh, we really need to, to work to set where we identify what are the top, top priorities. So when items like this come forward, it, it's very clear or whether or not are they, uh, are they a desirable thing? Sure, they're a desirable thing, but in these tough times, is it a top priority and is that where we should be spending our resources? And I would start with the employees. The employees that work in the various departments know from the inside out um, what is working, what is needed, what they could do without. They haven't really been given an opportunity to bring forward th their knowledge and their insights. And, uh, you know, a recent example was uh, the letter to the editor that appeared two weeks ago, three weeks ago, from the, uh, the president of Fires Fighters Union and said, these expenditures, although they were desirable, but they weren't, re they weren't required, they weren't necessities. And the concern is they're spent, we're spending money that when, it, um, when our, the grants run out or when there are other competing concerns, that we're going to have to start laying off employees because we're not um, saving our, re our financial resources. So um, I would definitely restructure the whole uh, budgeting process. I would include employees. I will go around and listen to employees, get ideas, work with department heads to uh, uh, prior prioritize e expenditures. There isn't any one big area that I think we can say, okay, we're eliminating this or eliminating that, but we really need to uh, look at within each bu budget, and that's why I started with uh, the bucket load as uh, the new car for the police chief. The, we, those are things that we have to learn to, uh, to do without, and I think we don't need more data. We need to be listening to the people who know. Uh, you know, again, I think, I think it's important that definitely that part of that process of going out and trying to get ideas, the mayor works with all the different departments, works with the employees in those departments who put together their budget and present and bring their proposed budgets to the mayor. So I definitely that's part of the process. What I'm saying is we also have to broaden that, to have employees be part of the process, but also have citizens be part of the process because part of what the government is doing is setting priorities for the community and what are the things that people are concerned about. I've heard a lot of concerns about, you know, the, 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 the condition of our roads and sidewalks and that that needs to be, a, you know, that's, as I go around the city and knock on doors, that's been sort of a, a ringing thing that I keep hearing. So that sounds like a, a community priority to me and that needs to be something that we need to put a special focus on. So I think that's the way that you can try to determine what some of the top priorities are. Um, and then again, you have to be really smart about thinking about ways that you can fund them. Because uh, we've really gone to the well in terms of the ways we can, uh, you know, the override question, which I think you asked, and I don't think either of us answered. Right. We can't, we can't do overrides. You know, we just can't. It's not sustainable. We've done like two in the 20 or 30 years since Prop Two and a Half has been in place. It's not a way. It's not a way to run a government. It's not sustainable. It's really a once in a generation kind of a firewall. But we have to. We're, we're going to have to deal with this creatively on our own. Who's the lady yeah, that said was next? No, there was a lady. I think mine was the right. Yeah. No, there was no. What's that? Yeah, I, I know. So Could I say you after him? Okay. okay. Sorry, I'm still I beg your pardon. So David, now it's Michael. John Lynn, uh, I live across the street <clears throat> in a school zone. Uh, and uh, I'm a retired school teacher. I had a superintendent's license, principal's license, and one of my major concerns has been speeding in the city. I've lived across the street for over 40 years. When I met my wife, uh, one of her stories was her great-grandfather, Sam August, uh, used to move about the city with a, a horse and wagon and do his business. Things have changed considerably. It appears that while going to the landfill, Trucks are speeding at incredible rates of speed. And indeed, it's just not the trucks going to the landfill. It's all over the city. We've tried some speed zone mechanical effects, but I guess my major question, and the question I've, the concern I've raised with the police department on numerous occasions is if we have traffic and speed laws, why aren't they being enforced? It seems to me 
it takes a long time to get the funding for roundabouts or some kinds of speed controls that we have to mechanically put on the ground. But we have a police force. I voted for the police station. And I really don't see them stopping the speeding and slowing it down. If a truck going down Ryan Road gets out of control, it will turn into a missile and can potentially be driven into either the kids out here in the field uh, who are playing during recess or even into the building. Thank you. Um, Michael. Uh, traffic sa safety has been a, uh, a long time concern of, of the city. Back in, I do, it was uh, the, the late 90s, uh, Mayor Ford started a task force on uh, for safer streets. It issued a report in 2000. Um, that report started a, a lot of things m moving forward, which resulted in uh, the Transportation and Parking Commission we have today. Um, and there was a, in 2002, there was a transportation plan that was written and put in place. I was on the committee that did that. Um, one of the things that we uh, used, there was a lot of, there's a lot of tools out there, a lot of research that had been done. Uh, one of them was in 2000 for the Mass Highway, um, uh, put together a traffic calming guidelines, um, which has resulted in a, a handbook. Um, and the, the work of all that has really has gone back for, uh, for several years with many, many people working very hard to look at um, the traffic problems and some of it's in the design of the streets, some of it, it is in the uh, enforcement. And there are things that we can do. You have to sit, analyze what the problem is, and come up with the, uh, uh, the proper solution. When I was a, uh, a ward council, I remember requiring, uh, asking of the police chief to set up a, um, a uh, speed trap on, uh, I, think, I believe it was West Street. And about uh, four or five days later, he said, um, I have uh, good news for you, and I get bad news for you. He said, we stopped. I think the number he used was 15 cars uh, speeding over the weekend. He said, the bad news is 12 of them are constituents of yours. <laughs> and I think that's the problem. You know, we, we have met the enemy and they are us. So we really have to do very aggressive on enforcement and on education. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, Michael mentioned all those various studies that took place over time and then the creation of the Transportation and Parking Commission. You know, I was then, the, I became the chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission and really tried to take those ideas off the paper and put them onto the roads in terms of how we improve traffic safety. I wrote the manual, the local manual for traffic calming, and we began to actually deploy and test some of those measures. Um, again, if you go up to Grove Street or Jackson Street or the work that's being, the testing that's being done on Riverside Drive, I think most of the research has shown that, you know, people aren't going to respond to signs, they're not going to respond to, you know, even tickets, really. you know, they, they, you get a ticket, but then the next day they're going to be out speeding again uh, or they're going to be flashing their lights. What really, what really changes people's behavior is changing the roadway, changing the road conditions to force people to slow down. So I think, I do think traffic calming is, is a great tool that we can use and I, part of this program is a neighborhood based program where, you know, neighbors like in the Jackson Street area who were concerned about many of the same issues you are, you know, got together, got petitions from all their neighbors, put together, you know, in anecdotes and data about the problems that were happening and brought it to the city and then working in partnership with them, engineers and the neighborhood came up with some solutions that we were able then to get some federal funding to implement. So I think the issue of enforcement is an important one. We definitely have to have enforcement. I think the trick, though, is you know, we have um, you know, many, many square miles of roads. We have about four patrol cars that are on duty uh, at any one time in the city. They do try to do routine speed work. They do try to set up the speed uh, table, as it's called. Um, but really, uh, I think what we have to try to do is build safer roadways and, and roadways that incorporate not only traffic calming features, but better crosswalks that have, uh, that have good sidewalks and, and accommodations for bicyclists. That's a bit of a longer process to get there, um, but I think that especially near school zones, those are high priority zones under our traffic calming manual. We, we assign points based on the priority, and I think schools are a high priority. So that's one that we can work on. 
Yeah, there is no one, one answer. Part of it is education, part of it is uh, enforcement, part of it is redesigning the roads and, and building and traffic calming uh, measures. Um, and there has been a lot of work done. You know, David's taking credit for the, the, uh, the product, but that has been the work of a lot of people over a, a number of years, um, and designing things, making recommendations, doing the research. It takes a lot of people, it's a community effort, and it really takes implementing it. And people need to be uh, uh, very uh, aggressive about that and working with neighbors, but that also takes money. And then we come back to, the, to that problem about priorities and, and having the money um, to do some of these uh, traffic calming me measures. But we need to work with communities and make sure that, and I think the people in the community have a lot of uh, ideas and insights of what would be effective measures to help make their uh, neighborhoods uh, safer. And for, you know, for example, their um, Smith College, who has uh, resources, have put in some new crosswalks there that have uh, slowed down the traffic through the, that period of uh, stretch of road that goes through Smith College. And we need to look at measures like that that would work in other neighborhoods, what's appropriate for no other neighborhoods. But finances is a key piece of that. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> So this will be our final question. Can we just end? Mm -hmm. Rachel Simpson. I grew up here, um, and I've spent a lot of time volunteering in the community and in the Pioneer Valley, and I'd like to hear from both of you how your volunteer experience has shaped your understanding of this city and its residents, since neither of one, neither one of you grew up here like I did. I get the first question. Well, there was a reference made earlier to the fact that I didn't work. Um, and actually, uh, I think the sort of the translation of that is, there, is that I was a stay-at-home dad. Uh, I stayed home and, and raised my two daughters, uh, Emma and Zoe. Um, and I don't know if there are any parents in the room, but if uh, you don't think raising kids is work, uh, please raise your hands. I don't see many hands here. So anyway. Um, what, one, of the, one of the things that that gave me the opportunity to do was to really immerse myself in the community, to get involved in community organizations, whether it was the Parent Center, the Northampton Parent Center, whether it was getting involved in volunteering on the 350th, whether it was volunteering in PTOs at my kids' schools or reading to kids in classrooms at my kids' schools or chaperoning field trips or getting involved with an organization called the Northampton Education Foundation, which is celebrating its 20th year this year. Uh, which has helped to raise hundreds and thousands of dollars for grants for teachers to help them carry out some of the work that they want to do, some of the innovations they want to do in the classroom. Um, uh, whether it's volunteering with some of the neighborhood associations, doing cleanups, or doing the work. I mean, we have a great community that is really volunteer-oriented, community-oriented. People really pull together in this community and come forward. When there's a problem, when there's an issue, you know, whether it's trying to save a piece of land, whether it's trying to save the Bean Allard Farm and try to create the wonderful space we have there, whether it's the response to the tragedy of the fires, people come forward in this community and they respond. And I think the volunteer work that I've done in the community has really given me a rich appreciation for that. It's given me an appreciation for the various layers of community organizations and neighborhood <laughs> associations that are in the neighborhood. And I think as mayor, I want to support that, I want to build upon that, and I want to try to find a way to integrate that into government and to how we can be a, a community that, that, that stays together, that works together to try to solve problems uh, facing our community. Uh, I'll uh, focus on the uh, community involvement that I'm, I'm doing right now rather than go over the last 30 years. But one of the things that I've been involved in is the uh, founding of the uh, Dementia Initiative and working with um, putting together an organization that will work with families that are dealing with the issue of dementia, very comparable to what the Cancer Connection does for families struggling with cancer. And I've worked with a, a woman in the community, uh, Eleanor Waken, um, very closely. Uh, she lost her husband after a 10-year battle uh, with dementia and being the sole caretaker. And what she said to me, no one should have to go through this experience. And so we work together. We're working with the hospital. We have um, a lot of resources and uh, structuring, beginning to structure an organization that will work with families. 
Um, I'm also a uh, member of the mentor program at the Hampshire County uh, Correction Facility in Jail. Um, there's a mentor program there when they're releasing inmates, they help in the transition. Um, I go up there, I've been, um, I've been going up there uh, every week. Um, and the person I've been working with has been released in the community and I uh, work with that person regularly to help him dealing with the issues he's dealing with. I'm a member of the Northampton Prevention Coalition, um, dealing with the issue of uh, drugs in our community. Uh, I was spending time and working on that issue. It's not an issue that a lot of people want to admit um, exists in our community, and, but we have some excellent um, expertise and organizations in this community and I'm working with those. I'm a member of the Elks. I do a lot in terms of working with veterans and working with the uh, youth um, in the, uh, the community. And informally, I've been an advocate for uh, residents in the housing authority. A lot of them may call up with issues. I have probably a dozen of them throughout the, uh, the city. And there are people who didn't get responses from the city councilor, and they still call me. And I meet with them and uh, John Height regularly on issues. In the spirit of the late hour, I will not offer any more comments. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for answering those questions. I think we had 14 of them, and now each candidate will have two minutes closing, and by agreement, David is first. Again, I want to thank uh, Councillor Mary on the barge and the other organizers who put the, together tonight's event, and thank you to all the people who came out and asked such great questions. I also want to say a special thank you to my wife, Yelena, and our daughters, Emma and Zoe, for their constant love and support throughout this campaign. I was born and raised in Western Mass in a large working class family of nine kids. My parents taught me the value of hard work and instilled a strong ethic of community involvement and service. I served my country in the Air Force after high school, was a student leader at UMass. I worked as a congressional aide both in Washington and here in Massachusetts and have been an active volunteer in our community, our schools, and our local government. During my three terms on the city council, I've been a positive and productive representative and leader. I've never shied away from tough issues or hard work. I've brought people together to create innovative solutions and tangible results to improve our community. Since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on hundreds of doors and sat in dozens of kitchens and living rooms across our city, listening and sharing ideas, and discussing my vision for creating economic opportunity and jobs, keeping our city livable and affordable, maintaining strong public schools, delivering smart and cost-effective city services, protecting our environment and keeping Northampton green and sustainable fostering active neighborhood and civic participation, and leading a government that is open, fair, and transparent. I believe Northampton needs a mayor with a positive vision and a steady, proven track record of leadership and results. A mayor who will unite our city and work hard every day for all of its people to find innovative solutions to the challenges we face. I am the candidate with the experience, the ideas, the energy, and the commitment to offer a new generation of leadership to move our great city forward. Thank you very much again for this opportunity, and I hope I can earn your vote for mayor on November 8th. Uh, thank you for those who organized tonight's <laughs> forum, and thank you to those who have stayed for a very long evening. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, for the first time in 12 years, the voters will be hiring a new mayor. There is a job vacancy, and you, the citizens, are the employers. Two of the major considerations in evaluating the credentials of the candidates should be experience and leadership. I am the candidate with the strongest resume. For over three decades, I have been a hardworking, diligent, conscientious public servant. I have served 16 years on the city council, eight years as city council president, and over 20 years on uh, various committees in the city, uh, and have chaired or been on virtually every city council committee. I, 12 years, I have been, over 12 years, I've been on the ordinance and chair of the ordinance committee. I've worked for 33 years in a uh, professional career and working serving uh, the children in the public school system. You can compare the resumes and the work experience. The important fact 
is my uh, resume de uh, demonstrates my record of leadership. I have an ability to work with a wide range of people regardless of their social or political beliefs. My, uh, I, it demonstrates my courage to take a stand on the hard issues and my compassion for and commitment to the citizens of this wonderful community. I have never desired to be a career politician. I consider myself a, uh, a public servant. Becoming mayor is a, not a stepping stone for me. I'm doing this because I love the community, I love the people here, and I would love to have your vote on November 8th. Thank you.